This is me. I'm Zachary Repencheck. I have nothing to disclose to you all here today, um, and you know we're gonna we're gonna have a, an in-depth discussion about the treatment of nausea and vomiting, and you know we're gonna start with you know good old Zofran, right? You know, so I know that uh, for these conferences and things, we're supposed to use generic terms, you know, so we'll call it endoncitron, but. You know, it's, it's kind of like everybody calls facial tissues Kleenexes, right? This is Zofran. This is a medication that we all, you know, call by its name Zofran. And I'll tell you a story. A couple of years ago, my brother had uh, a diagnosis of testicular cancer, and he's in remission now. He's doing great. But at the time, he needed chemotherapy. And, you know, I asked him if they were prescribing him any medications to help out with, like, his symptoms and his nausea and vomiting. And he said they were. And he couldn't remember the exact name of the drug, but he, he did remember that it sounds like a name you would give a dancing robot. And that always stuck with me, right? Like Endansetron. So I've always think that every time I, I, I see the name. So we love this medication. It is a great anti-emetic. It works so well for all different types of nausea and vomiting. I mean, you guys probably, if you're anything like me, you know, when when someone's vomiting, immediately, you know, a nurse is showing up with four Zofran in their hand even before you order it, right? This is just kind of what we use as a, as a catch-all for, for all types of nausea and vomiting as, as our pr primary antiemetic, and with good reason. It's an excellent antiemetic. It's a serotonin antagonist. It works really, really well on a large variety of types of nausea and vomiting. But for the sake of this lecture, what I would like to, us to do is a thought experiment. I would like us to consider what we would do if all of the world's supply of endansetron was just wiped off the face of the earth and just disappeared tomorrow. I mean, given the you know, supply, chain shor supply chain shortages that we have, you know, there's pharmaceutical factories burning down, tornadoes tearing through our drug supply, right? This isn't outside of the realm of possibility, right? That one day we just don't have access to this medication. But I want you to consider what you would do, how you would treat nausea and vomiting in a world without Zofran. And so that brings me to the two main premises of our talk here today. And the first one is that not all vomiting is the same. It may all look alike, but it may be coming from a very, very different place. The two people you have in two rooms next to each other, both vomiting, both making the same exact noises, may be doing it for completely different reasons. So the second part of that is to consider which antiemetic you give for your patient who's nausea and vomiting, right? So you want to help with them, their symptoms. You want to relieve their nausea and vomiting. So consider which drug you use based on what that underlying reason for nausea and vomiting is. So that's what we're going to do here today. We're going to talk about the different types of nausea and vomiting and then talk about which medications might be best tailored to the vomiting based on the type. So I'm going to break it down into four categories. We're going to do GI, vestibular, the brain stem, and the brain gut axis. So these are going to be our four big categories of vomiting. So let's start with the GI tract. The GI tract probably is what you think of first when you think of nausea and vomiting. So, you know, patients with gastritis, gastroenteritis, that type of thing, the patient, they're vomiting because they have inflammation within their GI tract, right? You get distension, stretch of, you know, the GI tract. And that creates vagal nerve activation, and it sends the neurotransmitters dopamine and serotonin. Neurotransmitters, I forgot to tell you, are going to be important in this talk. So you get stretch of the GI tract, and you get activation in the vagal nerve, which causes dopamine and serotonin to go up to the vomiting center, and it causes someone to vomit. Okay? So that's how your typical GI tract vomiting occurs. This is wildly different than vomiting that comes from the vestibular system. So what we're talking about here is people who have severe vertigo, you know, that vertigo dizzy patient that won't stop vomiting, people with motion sickness, vestibular neuritis, right? These people are vomiting just the same as the patient with gastroenteritis is vomiting, but their reasons for vomiting are wildly different, right? This isn't coming from down here in the GI tract. This is coming all the way up here with dysfunction of the inner ear. And so vestibular vomiting is caused by the neurotransmitters histamine and choline. So that's very, very different than when you get vomiting from the GI tract. The brainstem, a third place 
where you can get activation of the vomiting center and get nausea and vomiting. So there's an area at the base of the brainstem called the chemoceptor trigger zone. Sometimes we call it the CTZ. And this explains a lot of kind of like nausea and vomiting. Like this is like the other category, right? So basically this area, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, gets activated by, by something, by an inflammatory mediator, a cytokine, a, a chemical of some sort, and causes you to vomit. So for example, a pregnant patient with hyperemesis gravidarum is thought to be caused by rising HCG levels triggering the chemoreceptor trigger zone, right? Did you ever wonder why your patient with DKA is vomiting? It's because those ketone bodies, that, that acidic condition, is triggering the chemoreceptor trigger zone. This is the reason why so many medications have the adverse side effect of vomiting with them, is because some part of the chemical makeup of that medication is, is triggering this area. Chemotherapy, right? That's not just a creative name. That's where chemoreceptor trigger zone comes from. So this is kind of a, an other basket. And the chemoreceptor trigger zone is actually kind of easy. If your vomiting is coming from there, it, it contains all the neurotransmitters. So there's dopamine, serotonin, and a histamine, or histamine, choline. There's, you pretty much have your choosing of what you want to do if that's where the, uh, the vomiting is coming from. OK. Now, the most complex of the four types of nausea and vomiting is that that comes from the brain-gut axis. So the brain-gut axis is something that we're continuing to develop our understanding of. But kind of the, the short story of it is that the central nervous system and the GI system are very closely related. It has something to do with embryology and the way the two of them like developed side by side, but there's this really close link between your brain and your gut. And so we started calling that the brain-gut access. And it's, it's difficult to figure out exactly you know, why patients who have dysfunction in their brain-gut axis present with vomiting. But we're, we're starting more and more to have an understanding of it. The first time I gave a lecture on this topic, you know, about 10 years ago, for this slide, I had a picture of the cerebral cortex and I had a giant question mark over top of it. That's how I, because that, I was like, we don't know. It's coming from the brain somewhere, but we don't know why. So even in the past decade, our understanding of this process has increased and we've gotten a little bit of understanding. So there's two things that you need to understand for this. There's peripheral hypersensitization, and there's central dysregulation. Those sound like two kind of fancy terms, so I'll, I'll break them down real simple. Peripheral hypersensitization means that stimuli that wouldn't normally cause a reaction do, right? So the type of stimuli that wouldn't typically be noxious enough to cause nausea and vomiting does in a patient who has peripheral hypersensitivity of their GI tract. The second part is that central dysregulation. That's the brain not knowing what to do with signals sent to it. So it's misinterpreting signals and its response to it is to create vomiting. So it's this kind of like complex interplay between the GI tract and the brain. And we're learning more and more that people who have a dysfunction in this brain gut axis will present with you know, chronic or recurrent abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting. And it's this big subsection of patients that we've always had the most difficult treating and the most difficulty getting better. And as our understanding of this improves, our ability to help those patients also improves. So, kind of our, gonna be our bottom line section of this talk is gonna be, how do you treat the nausea and vomiting once you've determined what the underlying etiology of that nausea and vomiting is? So we're gonna break it down in the, by those four sections just like we went through. So the first is the GI tract, right? So again, we're living in a world where we do not have access to ondansetron. Ondansetron works great in the GI tract. As I mentioned, you know, serotonin is one of the major um, neurotransmitters that comes from the GI tract, and that's how ondansetron works. So if you don't have that medication, then we need to use dopamine antagonists. So metoclopramide or Reglan, in a world without Zofran, this is the medication that I'm probably gonna be leaning on the heaviest, because it works really well for nausea and vomiting, especially in the GI tract. Some people prefer prochlorperazine, compazine. Um, it tends to be kind of like a cultural, institutional, which one of these dopamine antagonists people use more. I think metoclopramide tends to be the better of the two, but either way, these are the antiemetics that you wanna focus on using in the GI tract. Metoclopramide, it has promotility effect, 
So if you have patients that are vomiting due to ileus, you know, um, constipation, opioid-induced effects, you know, pro metoclopramide might be a better choice because it can actually help move their GI tract forward. So in comparison, we talked about how the vestibular system is very, very different from the GI system in what the underlying reason for the vomiting is, so the treatment should be completely different, right? So you recall I said the vestibular system, we're dealing with histamine and choline. So antihistamines and anticholinergics are the best agent to control this nausea and vomiting, right? So you might be grabbing, you know, um, for your, your Reglan or your Compazine, but you aren't going at the underlying reason why these people are vomiting, right? So your vertigo patient who's vomiting, you should consider giving an antihistamine to, right? Like we give a lot of patients with vertigo get meclizine, right? I see patients on vertigo, who have vertigo on meclizine all the time. Well, meclizine's an antihistamine. That's why we give it to these patients. So good old IV diphenhydramine would be a, a really solid choice for your first antiemetic for a patient you know, who's vomiting because of vertigo or vestibular neuritis or some sort of like dizziness. Um, you know, Phenergan, which is promethazine, is also an antihistamine. Um, it's often used more in like the post-operative setting, but works great for these type of patients. Uh, diphenhydramine is a good choice because it also has anticholinergic properties, so you might be hitting it from a couple different angles. Um, but there's other anticholinergics too. You know, scopolamine is a medicine that can be given as a patch. Um, Dramamine is an anticholinergic. So you're gonna be focusing on, on these medications that you probably don't think of as anti-emetics. You think of them having other you know, purposes, um, but they you know, serve as anti-emetics in this scenario. And then benzodiazepines also make for really good anti-emetics. There is a lot of literature on the use of benzodiazepine as an adjunct to chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. And you know, we use benzos for so many things in the emergency department, but you may not think of it as being an antiemetic, but benzos tend to have really good antiemetic property. And this is one scenario, especially in this kind of vestibular dizziness, that it seems to work really well for nausea and vomiting. As I mentioned before, the chemoreceptor trigger zone is nice because it has all the neurotransmitters there, so you have a wide variety of things you can use. You know, metacopamide, Reglan is probably the one I use most. Uh, promethazine, as I mentioned, is an antihistamine. But there's a couple other things that work specifically at the chemoreceptor trigger zone. So are people familiar with this medication? Trimethobenzamide, or Tigan, as it's, it's often called. Anybody using this? Anybody familiar with, it, with this medication? It's kind of variable, uh, you know, the availability of this medication. Um, you know, it's not a place that everywhere has. I think it tends to be a little bit more expensive than some of the other medications, but it works directly on the chemoreceptor trigger zone. It has some dopamine antagonist properties, but what you need to know is it kind of works for all types of nausea and vomiting. Um, I know our, our psychiatrists really like using this medication because it doesn't quite have as much interaction with some of like the antipsychotic medications that our patients tend to be on. So patients who are on a lot of like psychiatric or centrally acting medications, this is a good choice if you have access to it. And then how about this? Anybody use, ever use alcohol swabs for nausea and vomiting? Yeah, great. This is like an, this is like an old trick that kind of, I think, um, became trendier recently in the past couple of years. This is something that I use routinely. I will go and see a patient who's vomiting, and basically, if the nurse hasn't come in to see them yet, you know, I haven't ordered any meds or the IV, I rip open an alcohol swab and hand it to them and basically say, here, use this until the nurse can come in and get your IV in, and almost use this as a bridge to you know, the other medications, what other therapy that I am planning on doing later. Uh, I will, just as a little personal side note, um, I worked a shift not too long ago with like a really bad GI bug and I was trying to do that typical emergency physician thing where you know, I would just like tough my way through a situation where I probably shouldn't have been working. And this is what got me through the shift. I was like, every time before I went in to see a patient, I like would sniff an alcohol pad and then go in. So, I mean, I was like doing it like out of sight so people weren't trying to figure out what I was doing all day, like sniffing things, but, um, but it actually helped, helped me a lot to get through the day. So um, this is one that I have adopted and, and used very liberally. There's very little downside to having your patient try this. All right, and then the most kind of out there 
uh, form of vomiting, this brain-gut access, like we talked about, this, this one that we're still not completely ha able to wrap our heads around, but are coming closer and closer to understanding. These are the patients that you want to use haloperidol for, right? Are you guys all using haloperidol as an anti-medic out there? It's, it's one of these medications where, you know, when I first started talking about this a couple years ago, I had to sell people on it that this could be used as an anti-medic. And these days it's pretty much, you know, routine that, that people use, have this in their bag of possibility for anti-medic. I will tell you, if you have somebody who you suspect their vomiting is coming from the brain gut axis dysfunction, you know, cyclic vomiting syndromes, cannabis hyperemesis, you know, recurrent and chronic vomiting syndromes that these patients have been worked up, you don't have an underlying pathology, they've had negative EGDs, they've had negative CAT scans, you know, for those patients, I would highly recommend going to haloperidol as a first line treatment. I know a lot of people have it in their bag of tricks for when like the other antimedics don't work, but I've moved to having this be my first line treatment in patients that I suspect, you know, are, are having vomiting coming through the dysfunction of the brain gut access. Maybe even better than haloperidol is droperidol. Now, how about this? How many people out here have access to droperidol or using droperidol? Good. So really good number. And this is, this is one of those medications that kind of got lost a little bit. It, it kind of got a bad rap. Um, you know, there was um, a black box warning that caused a lot of departments to kind of take it away and, and you know, stop using it. Um, I think we're learning more and more that uh, that was not as severe of a, uh, of a thing as, as came up. So um, droperidol is back and it basically is as good as haloperidol, works the same way haloperidol does, but maybe a little bit faster. So while we have really good evidence now showing haloperidol works well for things like gastroparesis and cannabis hyperemesis, um, I think what we're gonna start seeing in the next couple of years is studies that are doing the exact same thing with droperidol, um, showing that it works well for this particular type of nausea and vomiting. Olanzapine is an interesting one. So um, Zyprexa being the trade name has been used as a treatment for chemotherapy induced nausea and vomiting for years. It just, it never really escaped that bubble. So like that's how when Dancitron got its start, right? It was a chemotherapy associated nausea and vomiting medication. It was a cancer drug, it, it was a drug for cancer treatment. And then it escaped that bubble because it worked really well and now we use it for everything. So olanzapine is one of those medications that, you know, oncologists use it. It's used within that chemotherapy bubble but hasn't escaped and it probably has some uh, great future use for these type of patients who have associated psychiatric illness also presenting with nausea and vomiting, you know, involving the brain gut access. So I would keep your eye out on olanzapine as an emerging drug for, um, as an anti-emetic. And then this is another place where benzodiazepines, probably not the first drug that you're, you're grabbing, but these people who are vomiting and vomiting and can't get them to stop and you're kind of doing a last ditch effort before you have to admit them for intractable vomiting, don't forget to give benzodiazepines a try. My only point of caution would be, of course, if you're using droperidol and benzodiazepines together, you know, sedation can be a concern. But for the most part, when you're using medications like haloperidol, droperidol as an anti-medic, you're using it at a lower dose than you are if you're using it for agitation. So for example, haloperidol, two milligrams is a, is a typical IV dose for, as an antiemetic. Droperidol, 1.25 to 2.5 milligrams is a starting dose, which is much less than the five or 10 even that we use for agitation. So, so they're lower doses than the agitation dose, but as you start using multiple of them, combining them, you know, adding benzos on top of it, just keep an eye out for sedation. I tried to give this lecture without a slide about QT prolongation. And I will tell you, if I gave this lecture 100 times, 100 times someone at the end of it is gonna raise their hand and ask me about QT prolongation. So I've decided to just take the hint and address it head on. All of, um, nearly every medication that I just talked about in this lecture in the last couple of minutes has some degree of QT prolongation. Who will get their QT prolonged and at what dose is something we just don't really know. But my overarching, you know, general bottom line about QT prolongation with the antiemetics is nearly every antiemetic you will give at the dose you will typically use is not going to cause life-threatening QT prolongation. 
So for example, in Dancitron, which I know we're pretending doesn't exist, but we'll bring it back just for this, this scenario. They were doses of 16 up to 32 milligram doses of Dancitron were the ones at which that the studies show significant QT prolongation. The Droperidol studies that got its back black box warning was like 30, 40, 60 milligram doses. And I'm telling you that we're using 1.5 to 2.5 milligrams here. So the studies showing these meds having significant QT prolongation tend to be at doses much higher than the ones we typically use as our standard anti-emetic doses. Now the caveat to all this is, if someone is known to have a prolonged you know, congenital QT syndrome, a known prolonged QT, or they're on multiple medications that potentially can prolong the QT, you should, you should use caution, right? Methadone is probably the biggest one because patients often don't list methadone on their medication list, right? That's something you just have to get from them by talking to them about you know, their day-to-day -day life. Um, so methadone is, is the one that we see the most that prolongs QT to the point where you would have to be cautious with antiemetics. There's some antibiotics that do it. There's some you know, cardioactive medications that do it. Just have an idea of what some of the medications are out there that may prolong your QT and scan the med list for them. But an EKG is not necessary to give an IV antiemetic, okay? Unless that patient is known to have a prolonged QT or is on multiple medications that can potentially prolong the QT, you can give antiemetics at the doses that we typically give them. You know, it's only when you're giving multiple doses or when we're starting to mix medications that have potentially pro QT prolongation effects, that's when I hand for the EKG, okay? All right, so let's just bring it all home here and summarize what we talked about here today. The big takeaway is that not all vomiting is the same. Everybody who's vomiting may look similar, but their reason for vomiting might be wildly different from one patient to another. So understand what those different reasons for nausea and vomiting are. I like to break it down into these four big categories, the GI tract, right? You get distension, stretch of the GI tract that releases dopamine and serotonin causes vomiting versus the vestibular system, which, you know, when you get dysfunction of the inner ear releases histamine and choline versus the brainstem, the chemoreceptor trigger zone, which can be triggered by all number of medications and conditions and the brain gut access, which is this dysfunction that we see in patients with recurrent and chronic nausea and vomiting syndromes. And if you can understand those four big categories of why patients may be vomiting, then you can tailor the treatment you give to that underlying cause of vomiting and be more effective at treating their symptoms and you know, getting the patient that they care they, they need. And the good news is, Ondansetron exists. I'm gonna to continue to use it. You're gonna to continue to use it. But for the sake of our journey here today, consider how you would treat nausea and vomiting in a world without Zofran. And that's it.